again, most of my town hall meetings, we do them right here in the city council chambers. You usually have you know a couple rows of extra seats, so sorry for those of you who have to stand in the back and stand in the hallway there. Can you all hear me in the back there? Chief, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so I'll try to, I'm about to lose my voice too, so it's shouting to get into the back rooms. As you know, those of you who've been in my town halls before, I want to go through a PowerPoint. I want to talk about our federal budget situation, talk about where it's headed, uh, and, and what we basically proposed with the budget we passed last week to do about it. And then I just wanted to open it up. Uh, all, the only ground rule I try to keep to is since I'm your federal representative, let's stick with federal issues. Um, I can't get you out of your speeding tickets. <laughs> you can talk to the chief more at the back there. If you want. <laughs> no, but I, I just, you know, we don't do track, we don't do the local. Let's stick with the federal if we could. Because that's the best use of all of our times given that I'm your federal representative. So with that, let me um, do this without trying to, uh, and I'll try to verbalize, so I see folks in the back there, I'll try to verbalize um, what I'm talking about here, so those of you who can't see these charts um, can see it a little bit better. The point I, I simply want to say in the beginning of this is, we have a real budget mess in our hands, and we, the sooner we deal with this, the better off we're all going to be. And we've got to own up to the fact that our government is spending money it doesn't have, that we're borrowing way too much money that we can afford to borrow, and we can't keep on this path. Now, good people from different political parties have different ideas about how to fix this, but we all have to acknowledge that we have a problem, and the sooner we can address this problem, the better off we're all going to be. Now, let me just give you a quick snapshot of the federal government, of its budget, for this year. You, you all heard about the government shutdown, you know, the continuing resolution and the scenario. That was over about 17% of the federal budget for the next six months. What Congress does every single year is what we call discretionary spending. This, that's this orange and green slice of the pie. That's about 39% of the budget, and that's what Congress decides on an annual basis, the funding budgets for government agencies. The Pentagon is about half, and domestic agencies are the other half. Last two years, domestic government agencies budgets went up 24% on average, 84 when you throw stimulus. That's what Congress does on an annual basis. Congress does not control the budgets for the rest of our, our federal spending. That's considered mandatory spending or autopilot spending. These are programs that kind of grow on their own, and Congress doesn't appropriate money on an annual basis. If you qualify for a benefit, you get it. It's called an entitlement. If you're a farmer, you qualify for farm program payments, you get them. If you're a veteran, you get injured, you get veterans benefits. If you're, you know, we pay interest on our debt. If you're low income, you qualify for Medicaid. If you turn 65, you qualify for Medicare and Social Security. That area of spending is called basically autopilot spending. That is what is growing extremely fast, and I'll get into exactly why. If you look at what is driving our debt, and our debt is a compilation of our annual deficits. Every year, we spend more than we take in, we borrow money, and that adds to the burden of our debt. This year, we spend, we have a $1.6 trillion deficit. Or, more importantly, for every dollar the federal government spends, we borrow about 42 cents of that dollar. Now, the three main drivers of our future debt are our big entitlement programs. Mostly our age-based entitlement programs. Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. The big ones that are driving future debt is our health care entitlement program. Now, why is that? Um, I live here, and I know probably half the people in this room, I see so many familiar faces. <coughs> you know, we have three kids, six, seven, and nine years old. When they're my age, those three programs alone consume all federal revenues. If you just add interest to the debt on top of that, those three programs plus interest consume all federal revenues by about 2035. So this is the course we are on. Now, why is this? It's basically a few things. Number one, especially the healthcare programs, when they were created, men lived in their 60s, women lived into their 70s. Now men are living into their 70s, and women are living into their 80s and 90s. So these programs are lasting and costing far more than anybody anticipated. <coughs> Number two, when these programs were created, baby boomers were babies and teenagers, now they're retiring. And these are pay-as-you-go programs. Current workers pay their current payroll taxes to fund the benefits for current retirees. It works out fine if the ratios stay the same, workers and beneficiaries. 
but that's not the case. We're going from 40 million retirees to about 77 million retirees. In other words, we're increasing the retired age population by about 100%, but we're only increasing the workers behind them by 17%, people paying for these. That puts a lot of <coughs> funding pressure on the program. You combine that with the fact that health care costs go up a lot faster than the economy grows, than the rest of inflation grows. So those are creating a real budget crisis for us in the future, and the earlier we deal with this, the better off we're going to be. Now, when you borrow money, whether you're a government, a business, or a person, there are a few things you gotta pay attention to. Number one is are you borrowing enough money or to, money that you can handle? If you get a mortgage, are you, is your mortgage small enough or not too big enough that you can pay for it with your income? Also, who are you borrowing it from? Who do you owe the money to? We've had debt in the past. We've always had debt. Debt is not always such a bad thing. It's just the question is how big is it relative to your income? Who do you owe it to? In 1970, he had some debt. Not a real big debt, but debt. 95% of that debt, Americans owed it to each other. Basically, people bought treasury bills and lent the government money. World War II, we had a lot of debt. We went as high as 100% of our economy but we did through war bonds where we mostly owed it to ourselves. 5% of our debt was held by foreigners. 1990, our debt got bigger. 81% of our debt held by Americans. 19% by foreigners and foreign governments. Today, our debt is a whole lot bigger. And our debt right now, 47% of our debt is held by foreign governments, foreign foreigners. China is the number one holder, foreign holder of our debt. Here's the problem. You can't keep doing this. You cannot have a federal government where 42 cents of every dollar spent is borrowed and half of that is borrowed from other countries. When you rely on other governments to cash flow your governments, you're losing control of your, your destiny. You're losing control of your sovereignty. You're losing control of, of your own country's future fate and its economic future. This is an issue we've got to deal with and we can't keep going down that kind of a path. Now this is what they tell us the debt is going to. We've had debt, like I said, over here in World War II. It went as high as our entire economy. For every dollar we made in America, we, we borrowed. Then it went down. Here's where we are. It's a little over 70% of our economy. What economists tell us is when your debt gets as big as 60% of your economy, you start having problems. When you get to 90% of your economy, that's when your economy really starts to slow down. There's hundreds of years of evidence that shows that that is the case. We are going way above that. This is a, these aren't my numbers. This is the Congressional Budget Office that is telling us we are giving the next generation an a outright crash economy. By the time my kids are my age, for every dollar everybody makes in America, the government will be borrowing two under the current course we are on. We ask the Congressional Budget Office every year, what does the economy look like going into the future? Two years ago, they told us, by the year 2054, the economy crashes because of debt. Last, this year they're telling us that happens in 2037. There are computers that try to simulate and project the economy going forward literally can't conceive of a way in which the economy continues past 2037. The point I'm trying to make is this is an unsustainable debt we're walking ourselves into. And the sooner we deal with this, the better off we are. What do I mean when I say that? Another figure that government um, calculates is called the fiscal gap. What is the value of all the empty promises government is making to people today? Meaning, what are the promises our federal government is making to all of us? Those of us in the three different generations, the retirement generation, the working generation, our children's generation. What are the promises that are being made to them by the government? Minus what the government can pay for that. Two years ago, they said that the federal government had a $62.9 trillion unfunded liability, meaning the government was making $62.9 trillion, $62 trillion of promises it can't keep. It doesn't have the money for it. That's more than we're worth as a country. Everybody put together, that's more than America, American households are worth. Last year, that number went up to $76.4 trillion. This year, $99.4 trillion. Now, these numbers are so catastrophically, they're, they're unfathomably high. The point I'm trying to make here is every year you delay fixing this problem, every year, you don't get at the source of our debt problems. You don't get at this issue. We go over $10 trillion deeper in the hole. So again, the point I keep trying to make is, 
Let's avoid this problem from getting out of our control. Let's get this thing under control. That's why we passed a budget last week that's a lot different from the kinds of budgets Congress has passed in the past. In the past. Past P-A-S-S-E-D in the past P-A-S-T. I see one of my junior high teachers here. I want to make sure you know I'm getting this right. <laughs> so here's basically what we're saying. There's four things we're trying to achieve in this budget. Number one, get the government back into its historic size. Get the spending back down to where it historically has been and bring in the excesses. We've had 10% growth in the federal workforce in just the last two years. About 155,000 more people working for the federal government, a huge increase. Big increases in government agency budgets, 84% when you throw a stimulus on. Get that back down in size and focus on making government more efficient and more lean. The safety net. I think we've reached consensus in this country um, from most people that you need to have a safety net in this country to help people who slip through the cracks, to help people who are down on their luck, to help people who cannot help themselves. But our safety net remains unreformed. Some of the safety net uh, welfare reform was, was done in the 1990s and it proved very successful. It helped get people back onto lives of self-sufficiency. But that dealt with basically one of the 77 different federal welfare programs. So what we need to do, in our opinion, is get these programs more sustainable. They're growing at unsustainable rates. They're bankrupting themselves. And we want to have a welfare system in this country that is not geared toward keeping people on welfare, but getting people back onto their feet on a life of self-sufficiency. And one of the things we try to do with this <coughs> is have subsistence programs, food stamps and the like, combined with job training programs. We got 49 different job training programs spread across nine different government agencies in the federal government. We don't even measure whether they work or not. They don't even talk to each other. We don't even see if they're actually getting people into good careers. So what we propose to do is consolidate a lot of these programs and convert them into scholarships to go to people who get laid off, who are in industries. Look, this is Jamesville. We lost GM. Give people the ability to get a scholarship, meaning you know, money to go back to Blackhawk Tech, to go back to Whitewater, to wherever, to get training, to get into a career. This is the 21st century, and our welfare system still is more geared to the 20th. That some people in the mid-stage of their life, in their 40s, in their 50s, might need to go back and learn new skills to get better careers so they can get back on their feet and make good livings. And we want to make the welfare system more adaptable to that kind of reality. The third thing we try to do is you've got to fulfill the mission of health and retirement security, but that mission is framed. That mission is going bankrupt. These three programs, which are organized around fulfilling the mission of health and retirement security, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, they're all going bankrupt. So we've got to do things to make sure that they're solvent and reliable. And the things we propose, and I'll go into more detail them in a moment, is if you act now to shore up the finances for the next generation, you can continue to keep the promise to the current generation. We propose no changes for Medicare, no changes for, Med for Social Security for anybody who's above the age of 55. And the reason we can do that is because we propose to fix it for the next generation so we can borrow money to cash flow these promises for the current generation that's on them. The whole point I keep making is, let's do it now, meaning fix these things while we can do it on our own terms. If we wait till we have a debt crisis, then we're going to do what the Europeans are doing, because they hit their debt crisis. They're cutting people across the board. They're cutting seniors after they've retired. They're raising taxes on their economy, slowing it down making it harder for young people to get ahead and, and start businesses and, and, and create wealth for themselves. The last thing is, is we got to recognize our tax system is, is a messed up tax system. It penalizes growth, it makes it harder for people to save, and it makes our companies less competitive in the international economy. So we need to reform our tax code. We basically took a page right out of the President's Bipartisan Fiscal Commission, which recommended these kinds of tax reforms so we can get the economy growing. What I'm basically trying to say here is two essential things we're trying to accomplish here. Grow the economy so you get people back into jobs. If people are going from collecting unemployment to collecting paychecks, they're paying taxes, revenues go up. That helps us with our deficit and debt problem. But you gotta deal with spending. Get spending under control and reform the programs that are going bankrupt and causing spending to go out of control. Spending cuts and reforms along with economic growth are the key ingredients. Now, let me go into I'm gonna, the basic top lines. 
What we're saying is our budget versus the president's budget says bring spending back down to where it has historically been. And that cuts about $6.2 trillion of spending over the next 10 years out of the president's budget. As I mentioned, we have, he, he keeps spending at a high level and then it goes on from there. As I mentioned, spending historically since World War II has been at about 20 cents on the dollar. About 20 cents of every dollar made and produced in America is going to the federal government. Where we are headed, according to the Congressional Budget Office, according to the Office of Management and Budget, is spending is going on a huge increase. <clears throat> Mostly because of these entitlement programs, but also because of other factors. By the time my three kids are my age, the government is slated to be twice as big as it is today. That means double the tax burden Americans pay today, keep the same government we have today for them at that time. You really can't tax your way out of this problem. If you do, you'll shut down the economy. And you can't just raise taxes on a narrow slice of Americans to pay for a government like that. You'd have to do it to everybody. So government is really on a huge increased growth. Here's what we propose. Get spending under control and bring spending back toward where it historically has been. Now, when you take a look at deficits, we've had deficits before. For a brief moment in the history since World War II, we've had surpluses. Here's what they're saying is going to happen. We're down here in a recession. They're, they're basically saying we're going to come out of it, and our deficits will, will go, we'll get a little bit better, but then we go right off the cliff again. They're telling us we are giving this decade and this next generation huge deficits, which is what gives us huge debt. What we basically put in place is a plan to get our budget on the way to balance and in the surplus so we can pay off this debt. This is basically the fork in the road we are in. Are we going to do what we need to do to get our spending under control, to get us on a path to balancing the budget and getting this debt paid off, or are we going to stick with the status quo, which is really unsustainable? And when you take a look at it, it's basically about where is this debt going to head? Because the debt is our destiny. We've had it before. It's gotten high in the past, but it's going down later on. This is what they're telling us our debt is going to become if we stay in the path we are on. Here's what the Congressional Budget Office says our budget does. Our debt peaks in about two years as a share of our economy. It never gets close to that 90% threshold. Under the status quo, it gets way past that 90% threshold, and we pay off our debt over time. The goal here is this. Give the next generation a debt-free nation. We've always honored these commitments before. Every generation preceding us has always taken on its challenges that it's confronted, whether it's depressions or world wars or whatever. They made the sacrifices, they made the tough decisions, so the next generation is better off. This is our generation's challenge. Are we going to stick with the status quo and give our children a debt crisis, a diminished future, a stagnant economy, or are we going to do what we need to do to fix this? Now, there's one last issue that is probably the biggest one, and that is Medicare. Now, Medicare is becoming the biggest government program of all, and it's because of the things I said before. People are living longer. We're doubling the amount of people on the program because the boomers are retiring, and health costs are skyrocketing. So the question is, what do you do about those things? And if you fix this, that gives you a long ways toward fixing our fiscal problem. Here is what we propose. We basically are saying this. Don't change Medicare for current seniors. And the reason we can make that commitment is because you have to reform it for the next generation. So if you're 55 and above, meaning if you're on the program or within 10 years of going on the program, my argument is you've already organized your life around that. I mean, look at what happens, has happened to people in different big industries in America. Auto, airlines, steel. They work, they pay their pension, the company goes bankrupt, they lose their pension. There's nobody that can bail out the federal government if that happens. So let's get ourselves in the right fiscal situation so we can keep these commitments. And so what we're basically saying is, keep the commitment to the people who already retired and who are about to retire. And the way you can do that is we propose for 54 and below transforming the Medicare system to the system that works like the prescription drug benefit system or more to the key is like my program as a federal, uh, as a member of Congress for federal employees. Federal employees get a book of plans. They're pre-approved and regulated by the federal government. You know, you got Kaiser, you got Dean, you got Blue Cross. Mm -hmm. They compete against each other for our, our business. The government subsidizes it. That act of choice brings more competition. That's what we're basically saying. But 
we're also saying since there's finite revenue that can be gone, it got, there's only so much you can take from taxpayers to pay for this program. This program is growing so fast that it goes bankrupt in nine years and literally Medicare in and of itself at the end of the day consumes all federal revenues. So nobody, even the president included, is saying it can grow on the rate it's growing. So we're saying for 54 and below, have Medicare, have a list of Medicare regulated comprehensive health insurance plans that people choose from and then you subsidize those plans. And we basically say do this. If a person's wealthy, don't give them as much of a subsidy. If they're low income, cover all of their out-of-pocket costs. As they get sicker or if they're middle income, give them more subsidy. So basically, put money in society where it is needed the most. More for those who have less, less for those who have more. Doing it this way actually makes Medicare solvent, and it saves the system not only for the next generation, but it gives us the ability to cash flow and debt finance it for the current generation so they keep the Medicare that they have organized their lives around. The alternative is to put a global cap on Medicare, which is what the President's law does. We've never done that before, so there's a cap on the program now. He just recommended lowering it even farther, and he's created a board, they call it the IPAP, the Independent Payment Advisory Board, where you have 15 people that the President designates, and they make a decision on how to put price controls within Medicare for the current generation <laughs> to lower its costs. Now the problem with that route, and we've seen this over and over again, is Medicare already in many ways is under reimbursing providers. Go to Mercy, go to your doctor and ask them, they're already losing money on this program, and so what it will end up doing is it will actually lower services to seniors on Medicare. I really don't think that's the path to go to, but if you actually fix it for the next generation, we can afford to cash flow it for the current generation. This is going to be a big debate in the months ahead about the future of our country. Healthcare is the biggest one that is clearly, oh, and, and basically what we're basically, what I'm trying to say is, it's not as if these ideas are new ideas. You all know about Medicare prescription drug benefit, right? That's a new benefit that was created in 2003 to, to modernize Medicare so it covers prescription drugs. What a lot of people don't know is the way in which that drug benefit was designed has made a big difference. The drug benefit, the original idea was just have Medicare do it all. Have one Medicare government monopoly that, that pays for the drugs and manages the drug program. That is not what we went with. What Congress went with and what the law is, is there are a number of drug plans that seniors choose from for their prescription drug benefit. They don't like the plan they have next year, they can fire it and get another one. They can't be denied, they get to choose, and that act of competition has served to bring down prices, lower costs, and this is a, a government program that has come in 41% below cost. I mean, any another government program that has come in 41% below its original cost projections. The decision maker is the senior citizen, not the government. And the plans have to compete against each other for that senior citizen's benefit. And if a plan doesn't get the senior to choose, then it loses. And so they have to be competitive on price, they have to be competitive on quality, and we want to harness that kind of lesson for the future Medicare program. And we also have experience with our own plan in Congress and federal employees. More choices drives more competition, and that's the kind of lesson we want to apply for a future Medicare program so we can have a system that younger people can actually count on. Right now, there's no way Medicare has the funds to come up with the tens of trillions of dollars of funding that it doesn't have money for to guarantee that Medicare will be there for the younger generation. It's going insolvent in nine years as it stands. So what we want to do is fix it for the future so that it's there, make sure that it doesn't cost as much, don't go down the price control rationing route, and keep people harmless, held harmless for those who are in near retirement. Now at the end of the day, you know what we have a big argument about the balance of spending and taxes. I would simply say you can't even come close to taxing your way out of this problem. Spending is what is really the culprit here. This green line shows you where our spent where our revenues have been and where our spending has been since not, since World War II. Spending is projected to go on a huge upward cliff. Revenues are projected to basically be where they historically have been. If you even try and split the difference by a third, 
the kinds of tax increases you would have in this economy are, are, are things we, 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 our economy couldn't sustain itself. A lot of people say, well, just make corporations pay more in taxes. If you had a 100% tax of all the profits of every Fortune 500 company, it would fund the government for 40 days. I mean, if you took every dollar of income for everybody making every over $250,000, which most of which are small businesses, it would fund the government for seven and a half months. The point I'm trying to make is, spending is the problem here. We've got to focus on our spending problem. And the sooner we do that, the better we can do it on our own terms. If we don't get ahead of this problem and do it on our own terms, in our own way, like we've just discussed, then we'll have a debt crisis, and then you just have to do across the board stuff. Then you don't get to prioritize. Then you don't get to hold harmless people who have already retired. That's the kind of painful austerity that you have in Europe that we want to try to avoid. So with that, let me just open it up for your questions. and. Um,